My name is Jenny Dixon and I am Deputy Vice-Chancellor Strategic Engagement here at the University. And I thought just before I introduce our speaker, I'd just make a few comments about our creative thinking project. Are you hearing me okay? Yes. Great. The, the creative thinking project is here at the University of Auckland and it engages staff and students from across our faculties as well as from the wider public, government and industry. And we aim to deepen people's understanding of the creative process and to promote the value of creativity to our communities, to business um, and individuals. The project with the support of the Chartwell Trust and the Ho Visual Arts and Education Trust has actually been very busy over the last uh, actually few years. We've uh, produced two books. We deliver a general education course, which is open to all undergraduate students and is very popular. Uh, we're involved in research from a number of academics around the creative environment. We're hosting an international symposium next week about creativity in the curriculum, uh, which is of course a, 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 an, an issue dear to our hearts. And we have a wide range of interviews and resources on our website, which is www.creativethinkingproject.org. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr Adler is the S. Bronfen Chair in Management at McGill University and is one of Canada's leading professors um, in this field and has been named a 3M Teaching Fellow. Uh, Dr Adler is widely published in articles, in films and books about her expertise in global leadership and cross-cultural management. Nancy is also a visual artist working primarily in watercolour and exhibits her paintings, some of which are held in private collections worldwide. She can think visually, she is creative and innovative, and we are excited to hear about what she has to say tonight about returning to beauty as we develop leadership skills for the 21st century, and the role that creativity and the artistic imagination plays in that. Please join me in welcoming Professor Nancy Adler. I'm ignoring the technology. I'm delighted to be here, and I want to thank the Creative Thinking Project as well as the university, even though you can't see me anymore. <laughs> Even though I've only been here for a couple of days, I've had more interesting conversations in the last couple of days than in any 48 hour period that I can remember in a long time. And I think part of the reason for that is the reason that all of us decided to take an hour out of our precious time and schedule to come together. And that's the fact that when we look out at the world at the moment, we know that the first word that comes to our mind is not beauty. If we care about what's happening with humanity, we know that the size of the challenges and the type of the challenges and the interrelated network of those challenges means that there's absolutely no way we can use the approaches we've used in the past and have any hope whatsoever of anything we would define as success. Think about it, Einstein kind of coached us 50 years ago in saying that it's insanity to assume that if we use the same approaches, economics, politics, the military, to solve our biggest issues in society, we would get different results than what we've got in the past. And unless there's somebody in the room who thinks that the world is currently perfect, in which case I want to sit next to you at dinner and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, then we have to go back to a very big definition of creativity and a very big definition of aspiration. I'm going to wander back here because I have this illusion. Can you, can you mic is off? 
the mic is off. Can you hear me? Yeah. They can hear me. So but you can't record it. There is no audio going ah. to the recording. So can you? Um, ta-da, 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 ta-da. We are going to have this slight pause where I go up here and Pip figures out how to turn back on the mic that was turned on, but evidently it's Sorry turned off. Ta-da, ta-da, ta-da. Could you turn on my mic? This is a different definition of being turned on that we usually use. <laughs> OK, thank you. Now we can get her. John O'Donohue, who's a philosopher, has said, now, now, is the time to invoke beauty. Not next week, not next month, but now. And singer-songwriter Phil Oakes said, in this ugly world, the only true protest is beauty. So I want you to think for a moment about the world as you see it. So in warning, I am going to, we are going to be talking very big picture because we're all a part of the whole world right now, even if you're very far away in New Zealand and have this sense that you can avoid being out there. As I look out at the world, I get concerned about whether it's global warming and the overall environment. I get concerned about income distribution and wealth distribution, I get very concerned about the fact that we somehow, in the 21st century, in 2017, still think that killing each other is a way to solve differences. I get concerned about the refugee crisis, I get concerned, I get concerned, I get concerned. So if I enter that conversation and I really take Einstein seriously that we can't draw on our ways that we've used in the past. And a small secret in here, it wasn't a part of the introduction, but my first degree, and I worked originally in Washington, D.C. as an econometrician. Oh, how many painters who are econometricians who are professors at McGill have you invited? You don't have to answer that yet. Okay? So I want you to think, as you look out at the world, what concerns you right now? Just keep that in mind, because I don't want it to be my definition. I want it to be all of our definitions. I want to add the lens of beauty to how we go about looking at how we create that world. Notice I'm using the word add because I'm not throwing away economics, politics, the military, et cetera, science, okay? But I'm adding a layer. And in adding a layer, I want to invite in what we know from great artists and especially what we know from great artists that's similar to what we know from great leaders. And so there have been all sorts of studies, of course. When I say great, I'm using not in the sense of popularity or worse yet, richest. I'm using the sense of really frame-breaking, really made a difference in whatever their domain was so that after that the world saw things differently. Um, and there are three ways in which great artists and great leaders are actually very similar. The first of which is that great artists and great leaders have the courage to see reality exactly the way it is. So they don't base it on somebody else's description, somebody else's illusion, what's popular right now, what's politically correct right now. 
is traditionally we've thought about artists often as the outlier in being able to see things that other people aren't seeing right now and bring them in various ways to our attention. That's exactly the same starting place of great leaders. And what they see can be opportunity or it can be threat, but it's what's actually out there. The second, I'm going to come back to each of these, so I just want to give you all three of them first, is great artists and great leaders have the courage not only to see reality the way it is, but to envision possibility, even at times when other people feel that it's trapped, confined, we can't go very much further. They have the skills at being able to see possibilities that others don't see. And that's often a classic definition, I'm in a school of management, of great entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs see opportunities in the marketplace, in society, that nobody else saw. Okay, C.K. Prahalad, who was one of my favorite, favorite, favorite people and strategists, when he came out with his studies that became his book, Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, he was the first one at a world, on the world stage who said the two-thirds of the world's population that makes less than a dollar a day is a market that can be served so that their life is better and sustainably, meaning that the company is making enough money doing it that they'll stay in business. And even though at the time he came out with that book, he was considered one of the top 10 strategists in the world, it took him more than five years to get the book published because no publisher would accept the idea that you could serve people's real needs who had very, very little money and still do that in a way that was profitable and sustainable. And I'm using profitable and sustainable um, almost identically because that's how he went in and that's how it was understood and that's how it ended up working. Okay, so envision possibility. The third and last of the three is that great artists and great leaders have the courage to inspire others to move from current reality back to possibility. And again, artists, we've often thought of artists as those who inspire in society through whatever modality of artistic expression they use, but those who can take us on a journey beyond the everyday. You'll notice that in all three of them, it's prefaced by have the courage to. There is no such thing as leadership, let alone great leadership. There is no such thing as really being an artist without courage. And courage in the sense of if you're going to see with your own eyes and if you're going to act from that place, then you're often standing alone. Because if somebody else had already seen it and was already doing it, then you wouldn't have to have thought it up. It wouldn't be a creative act. So there's an aloneness. There's a moment always of courage to stand alone and say, how could I possibly be right? When everybody else is saying the world is flat, how can I actually trust when nobody knows that the world is round? Go take your ship and <laughs> start sailing towards the boundaries. But there's always that moment of courage. And there's an interesting, very interesting, which we won't go to today, discussion, dialogue, around how much of leadership today in the world is take a consensus, take a poll, find out what everybody is thinking or saying, and then doing that versus how much you bring in a new idea and how you play those two off. And of course, the extremes are, if it's too much just what I want to do, it's dictatorship. If it's too much just take a poll, it gets labeled nicely as democracy, but it actually is the complete absence of leadership. So that's always a dynamic. But the part of courage in there is never absent. So what I'd like to do is to come through each of those and say, where does artistic lens and creative lens come in? Where does beauty come in? And how might, there are two mice here. Maybe they propagate it. OK, uh, the courage to see reality the way it is. Think for a moment 
about how we go about seeing the world. Now bring that up to 2017, you could even go back to 2010, and we've had this huge uptick in not only seeing with all our scientific ways of seeing and all of our other traditional ways of seeing, but we also now have big data. So we're supposed to be able to see much better. And we have big data analytics, so we're supposed to not only be able to see more, but we're supposed to be able to see the patterns in what we're seeing much better. So in 2017, we should be fairly good at this first step, are we? Well, think for a moment, again, on the world scale. Um, ever heard the term Brexit? What happened there? I mean, we had all of the skills in terms of surveying, in terms of getting more data, in terms of being able to get it from different sources, in terms of being able to pattern it, and the collective prediction was wrong. Now, was that one aberrant event? Of course, we know it wasn't because then along came the United States and Hillary Clinton, who everybody said was going to win, didn't. Notice how clever I was not to have used the other name in that <laughs> sentence, okay? But it was the same, it was the same pattern and any of us who know anything about week one statistics know that to get that many surveys being wrong, public opinion surveys, voter turn, et cetera, surveys to be wrong, you have some other dynamic going on. Now, is it just the big in the world cases that we've all heard about? Just let, no. Just last week, if you look locally in my definition of local in Montreal, we had an election for mayor. We had an incumbent, uh, Denis Cordier, who was shockingly, supported by all three of our major newspapers. The reason that's shocking is two of our major newspapers are French and one is English, and we are really good at not agreeing across the English-French divide. All three of them supported him. All the major business leaders and, and society leaders were supporting, vote publicly supporting. And guess what? He lost. And he lost to a woman. We've never had a woman before, so take a category and he lost to a woman who's from a party that most of us had never heard of before and had never been in a party that had never held office before. Huh, what's going on that we're not able to see? And the question that I would ask before we start looking at how we see, how we collectively see in society, our society, how we collectively see our world while we're citizens of the world, is I want you to, this isn't just me, I want you to think for a minute about what do you think right now we're not seeing either locally or globally in whatever domain you look at. I want you to think for a minute and then just turn to your neighbor, ideally the neighbor on the other side of you who's not the person you walked in with, and just share what one or two of the things that you have this sense we should be noticing, but the world either is completely not noticing or they're not publicly noticing, i.e. they're not talking about it, they're not dealing with it. You have a whole 60 seconds.
Okay. 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 Just, just listen. Just listening to the conversation level, I would say that I'm not the only person who's a little suspicious we're missing a few things. Just keep in mind what you just said, and we'll come back to it. But if we're not seeing and not paying attention to things that are important, how might we start seeing them? And that's when I turn back over to my artists. And I'm going, because we only have an hour together, I'm going to draw at different points from different art forms. But why not start with the visual arts, right? So most people who've even visited the visual arts know that you often start not by painting or sculpting, but where do you start? You start with drawing, okay? And the very, the very first time that you go to any kind of a drawing studio course, somebody suggests you go on YouTube and find a little video, you know that it's not about how you hold the charcoal or if you're using charcoal or Conte or graphite or whatever. It's about seeing. And so the art of learning to draw is the art of learning to see. And again, for those of you who've played with it, one of the classic little exercises at the beginning of a drawing class is to have you draw somebody's face. So we're sitting across from each other and I draw your portrait, your face, okay? And before I'm trained, somehow, and it happens worldwide, your eyes live up here. Because we have this imagination that eyes are sort of at the top of a face and a mouth is at the bottom of a face. And no matter how much I look at this beautiful face, where the eyes are exactly where they're supposed to be, right about in the center of the face, they, in my picture, until I'm trained, they migrate up. And then, with all sorts of wonderful techniques, I begin to learn how to actually see. I then can get creative and get imaginative, but the first step is, can I see? Frederick Frank, who's a wonderful Dutch artist, has published about 25 books, my favorite of which is, What Does It Mean to Be Human? I recommend it to everybody and anybody is Frederick Frank wanted to have everybody in the world learn how to draw. Not because he thought that would be a really good gig, he would, you know, and not taught by him, <laughs> but because he believed that if we could really see each other, to draw, you have to see each other. If we could really see each other, and if we could really see the planet, then we couldn't treat it the way we're treating it now. We couldn't treat each other the way we're treating each other now if we could actually see each other. So the first pirating in from the arts is if in fact we want to learn how to see, it would be really good if we started with some of the practices and techniques from those people who actually know a little bit about seeing. Um, I'll give you another example, though, not so I go back and forth, not from uh, visual artists, but one of my colleagues at McGill, colleague and friend, uh, Henry Mintzberg, who's a strategy professor, works all over the world, lots of people like his stuff. When we had our last referendum in Montreal, because one of, or in Quebec, one of the rituals in Quebec is every so often we rev up to pull Quebec out of the rest of the country because we're going to be, we're different, we're French speaking, we're going to leave. Um, and so everybody gets revved up. And this particular referendum ended up very, very close. It was basically 50.8% ended up voting to stay a part of the rest of Canada. So it was very, very close. And what Henry did right before that election was he asked people to turn off their radio, to turn off their TV, to turn off their computer, to go to their window, open it, and look outside with their own eyes and ask themselves, are you friends with your neighbor? Do your kids play 
with your neighbor's kids? Do you work with people who speak a different language than you do? So what he was asking people to do is to turn off how we're supposed to see the world and come into our own reality of how we experience the world. And of course, in Montreal, everybody's busy working with, talking with, having dinner with, going out bicycling with everybody else. But we'd forgotten how to see that because we were told that we were so different from the other that we couldn't even live in a country that had a dominant language group that was different from our own. The belief is that if we could see, then we would act on what we saw and we would begin moving the world in a better direction because we're basing it on what's really there. And there's some basis for truth in that. So you look at things like, um, there are lots of examples, like global warming. So just last week, Syria signed the Paris Peace Agreement, so that, um, or the climate agreement, not peace agreement, climate agreement. And so we now have every country in the world except one, that country to the south of Canada. Uh, <laughs> that has signed the agreement. So what, what did you have? You had a whole bunch of scientific data. Then you had people like Al Gore, a politician, using an art form, filmmaking, an inconvenient truth, to begin to engage a whole public around a conversation. And now you have the world coming together. Now we can all say it's too little, it's not enough yet, etc. but it's movement in a direction. And it's not surprising when you look to that country to the south of Canada that there's a huge layer of denial of climate science, so seeing the world differently, so then the actions in the world about identifying what's a problem and how you would act on it are different. And if I give one other example, um, not to beat up on the country to the south of me, and I do have to admit at this point, is I was born in California, uh, which makes me have certain rights to say things about that country to the south of Canada that people who didn't grow up there um, sound different when they say similar things. But if you look at the whole issue of mass shootings, it's been exactly the same pattern. Um, if you look right now, almost um, six times as many the, in the U.S., there are almost six times as many shooting guns and five times as many mass shootings as any place else in the world. And no matter how much the description tries to be that, oh, it's about more violent people. Well, guess what? You're, I'm standing in front of you. Genetically, people who are born in the U.S. are actually not different on a violent scale than are people in other parts of the world or the healthcare system or whatever. All of that you can scientifically get away from. You can't get away from the guns. But if you deny that it, the guns are a part of it, then you can't move on to any solution and the statistics just keep on getting worse and worse. Um, small problem. You may have noticed there hasn't been much about beauty in here. There's been a lot about ugliness coming from my descriptions. And I have to admit that as I first started thinking about great artists, great leaders, what could that mean for how we address the world? And I thought about that first step, being able to see reality the way it is. I actually thought more about ugliness. I didn't label it as such. But I thought about what's wrong if we could really see it, then we could correct it and do something about it. If we really saw the increasing split in wealth gap, income distribution, et cetera, if we saw it, then we would do something about it, or at least we could do something about it. It wasn't until later that I began to realize that we're probably even more challenged to see within reality, the beauty that's there, currently there, in current reality, than we are to see the ugliness. We're not very good at seeing, period. But we're even lousier at seeing 
the beauty. Um, and that's probably not surprising because if you look at our contemporary culture, think about the daily news. What proportion of it tells you about something that's going right versus something that's going wrong? Look at, I love the stories about companies and CEOs. How often do we hear about the guy who's figured out for, or the woman, for her company to be able to do well financially by doing something really good in the world versus the one who has just been caught in some kind of sexual harassment? Okay? We don't hear the stories. They're there, but we don't hear them, so then we don't perceive that they are, in fact, there. Um, art, in the art world, of which a number of you are from that world, visual arts world, went through the 20th century, and is very much so the second half of the 20th century, sort of disparaging beauty. Beauty was what those old masters, classical people, they probably all did still lifes and had pretty flowers in there. You know, that's not us. What we're going to do, and we went through a whole phase of shocking people, that artists were going to shock you with their art, wake you up by shocking you, and that shocking tended not to be beauty. Luckily, that's been turning around, so beauty and the voice of beauty has come back in and is weaving back in in some very interesting ways in the 21st century. So if we're really lousy at seeing beauty and taking it into the public dialogue, we have to bring ourselves back to being able to see it. So I want to give you, this time only 45 seconds, this is a really tight time conversation here. I want you to think for a moment, these are like testing your own skills at seeing beauty. Think back just to the last 24 hours and think back of the moments, the beautiful moments that you either saw, smelled, heard, touched, tasted. Just do a scan of your last 24 hours and find at least three moments and I say moments because I'm not saying the whole 24 hours was. And you're right, you can share it with the person next to you. Okay, that's, that's enough beauty in the room. Cool it, cool it. Quest, question, was there anybody in here who could not think of a single moment? Aha. So the question is lens. The question is, if we ask ourselves, then we start being able to see it again. And we can, I'll, I'll take it back up a level. And we started very impersonally. But it's not that it's not there. It's just that our lenses, in a sense, kind of like my microphone, aren't turned on. The, the conceptual framework we now have for that, that only came into our leadership dialogue in the early 21st century, is positive deviance. So deviance always means outlier, but usually has the notion of deviance is negative. Positive deviance says, What's the outlier that's the very best of the best, or the very most beautiful out of the day? As soon as I start looking out at situations in the world, or in my organization, or in my community, through the lens of positive deviance, 
I asked questions like, in this particular committee, executive board, what was the moment that we were absolutely the most effective in getting what we really want done? So I don't ask, are you this terrific team that always gets the very bad? No, because everybody's going to go, yeah, right, this committee? Okay, but I ask, of all the time you've met together, what's the absolute best of the best? What's the most beautiful moment? And I have to admit, the first time, I, I love positive deviance as a lens. It's extremely helpful to me. But the first time I ever took it into a corporation, I was working with a group of senior executives, and I asked them the question I just gave you, in this team, in this senior executive team, what's the absolute best moment you've had. And they came up with their moment. And I then asked the next question you always ask to move that into action is what allowed that to happen? And then the third question is, how can there be more of those moments? But if you ask the second question, what allowed it to happen, it tells you what you, the conditions you need in order to reach that beautiful moment. And the first person that spoke up said, the CEO wasn't here. <laughs> now, the problem with that was that the CEO was sitting in the room. That's when you're really glad you're a consultant and not an internal person. OK, so beauty, and especially when you talk about great art, great beauty, great leadership, great moments, always is that deviant out there. It wouldn't stand out if it was the norm. And as we move, which we'll get to, as we move into how does this work, the question is, how do I then pull, coach, and coach, encourage the deviant to become the norm? How do I create epidemics of beauty? How do I create epidemics of positive moments? As I asked you about the most beautiful moments in your day, how do you populate your day with even more of those moments? It's always, how do you go from the extreme outlier and then bring it back into the norm, rather than our normal way of thinking, which is, what's the average? And then we talk about regression towards the mean. Okay, It's not the same. Dynamic. It's a dynamic that starts with the uniquely spectacular and then says, how do you create an epidemic of it? So there's an interesting dynamic going on in the world that makes it particularly interesting for me to have the privilege of visiting you here in New Zealand. Because the world, when they look out at countries at the moment that are positive deviants, Guess what countries they come up with? And by the way, <laughs> Canada and New Zealand are viewed by much of the world as countries that have their act together in terms of stability, in terms of civility, in terms of democracy, in terms of, we both know that our countries have plenty of things we need to solve. But right now, we're being seen as, usually without that vocabulary, as the positive deviants, as the ones on the pedestal. So it's a unique moment to not only get it right at home, but it's a unique moment to use what's right at home to help the world get it right. And part of that's choices about what's made visible and how you make it visible. But I think it's an extraordinarily important moment for New Zealand. And like I say, I would turn the mirror back on me, but I can turn it on you at the moment. Um, so just summarizing, and the first one is the base, so we can go through the other two more quickly, is to lead in the 21st century, we need to be able to see. To be able to do that, we can't use our big data analytics, scientific methods slowly. They need to be coupled with new ways of seeing so that we can actually see the world. And that world we need to see needs to be both the ugly, the what's wrong, what we wish we weren't seeing, as well as the beautiful, what is it that we're doing right? 
what would happen if there was an epidemic of New Zealand societal dynamics throughout the world? How would that feel to the people in Syria? Second is great artists and great um, leaders have the courage to imagine possibility, to imagine a more beautiful world. Um, one of the things that makes that tricky is that oftentimes if, oftentimes if you come up with a statement like, what would the world look like if you had an epidemic of New Zealand's, if you had, and they go, don't you know New Zealand's different and you don't understand anything about it, and plus we've got all these problems here. In any way, you can never, because culturally they're all different. People immediately assume that if it's too positive, it must be impossible. If it's too beautiful in the sense of it's what we really want and aspire to, it can't be possible. And then you get labeled as naive or inexperienced or stupid or worse. So that word courage becomes hugely important. What skill can we pirate from the artists on this one? Well, actually, it's a skill that the artists use, but also the entrepreneurs and innovators in science and a whole bunch of other domains use regularly. There are a bunch of skills we can use, but just using one as example, and that's serendipity. Okay, and what, what, how does serendipity work, just as a description? Serendipity says, Something happens, either I made it happen or it just happened. It is a complete mess, looks like a failure, looks awful. And then I come back and I look at it again and I see some kind of possibility or opportunity in it. And of course, the classic example is all, always the discovery of penicillin. You know, also, if you want more mundane, the discovery or the creation of post it notes which even in today's digital world, we're still using post-it notes. Okay, all of those things started out as mistakes. Me, who decided to not paint this year and take up ceramics, have discovered that serendipity is my friend every time I send some poor pot into the kiln, knowing exactly what I had planned for that pot to be like when it came back out. And it always comes out, and I, my first reaction is I hate it. And that has a lot to do with it's not the way I had expected it to be. Then I come back a day later, and I discover that it actually has some potential. And if I come back about four months later, it has even more potential. So my ability to see it is really um, um, blinded by the fact that I have expectations. So that happens in science. We do a really carefully planned scientific experiment, and what ends up happening, we can't see anything except what we're looking for, either happening or not happening, but not what, what we had never thought of before at all. Um, one of the best ways to invite serendipity is to say thank you when something goes totally wrong. And you can say it inside. You don't have to say it out loud so they don't take you off to the loony bin. But by saying thank you, you invite in that there's something there to learn from it. And by the way, we know that with great artists and great leaders, there have been great great studies on the great leaders on this, that, of course, great leaders take more risks than do normal people. They therefore fail more often. And so somebody said, oh, so in companies, all we need to do is hire people who failed before, and then, no. <laughs> and they also learn much better, so they almost never repeat the same mistake. <coughs> so that learning, what is there in there to learn? But the thank you is even bigger than that. And the thank you, it's interesting, I was in June, I was over in Europe, and we were using serendipity with, um, okay, I'll use his name, with Trump having been elected in the U.S. and what the influence of the U.S. is in the world right now. 
And as soon as that lens was put on, I mean, the first reaction was people laughed. And the second reaction was, Europe is coming together. And people are, are forming networks around climate change and trade and what, in ways that Europe didn't think it could. It doesn't make, watch out, it doesn't make the disaster good. It's not saying the disaster is good, it's saying what's the good part out of the disaster. The other way that I find is really helpful is to go to a different, um, we, in scientific terms, we'd say a different level of analysis or a different perspective, going the macro, micro, um, up and down. So in visual arts, the way we often do that when we're first learning and then later we just know how to do it, we have a painting and then you go with L's, with the matting board that you've cut at a diagonal, and you go find the painting within the painting. So like the whole painting didn't work, but if you just home in on this part, it actually worked really, really well. So you find the beauty, you find the harmony, you find the design inside of the bigger picture. So that's the same thing when you're looking out at a situation is you find what is working, you're back out into positive deviance, then you can bring it back in. But the important difference between this and, and just envisioning something is you're grounding it in what's really there. So that first skill and the second skill are completely linked together. One, um, one of the most powerful examples, again, looking out in the world, um, I had a very interesting, um, he was a, a design manager in a group that I was working with from Norway. And I gave the whole example and um, somebody said, do you mean to tell me that you want me to say thank you for the situation? They had a mass killing in Norway where 71 people were shot on an island that was a kid's camp that was political. Most of them were kids and died. And of course, the answer is absolutely no. Nobody would say that that's good. And then another one of the Norwegians in the room turned to him and said, what was good is that following that, we publicly came back to our core values as Norwegians. And we publicly said the question we need to answer is how we have a caring, open, safe society. And we don't need, know how to do that, but we're not going to give up on open and caring in order just to get safe. And at least we began talking about it. That's the sense of serendipity. So it's, it's, it's a tricky line not to fall into. I'm not saying that the disaster is good. I'm saying, what did I learn or what can I find within it? That's good. I want to add the third layer before we're totally out of time. Um, so the first, again, the first two fit very much together. Can I see? Can I imagine or see the best? And then the third one says, how can I begin to inspire people to move towards those possibilities that come out of both seeing reality the way it is, the ugliness and the beauty, and having some different vision? Um, and for this one, I'm actually going to let go of visual arts and um, throw in a new art form and bring in music. So my question is, my question is, how can music take us from poverty to prosperity, or from global conflict to global community, or return nations from independence back to independence and democracy, or how can music return our humanity in societies that have been afflicted by war, extreme poverty, etc. And to respond to that question, I want to let the musicians talk 
for themselves. Um, let me just ask quickly in here, are, how many of you are familiar with El Sistema? Not everybody, about three or four. So let me really quickly, um, I'll let you look at them and I'll tell you a little bit about them. El Sistema was started in Venezuela. It was started by Claudio Abreu. Claudio Abreu, bless his soul, was an economist. And he was working at a national policy level and he was working among other issues on poverty. And he realized that the vast majority of initiatives were not making any difference. And we know in international development that the vast majority of poverty initiatives actually leave the um, target country, the recipient country, worse off than before the initiative ever went in. So we don't have a good track record with our normal ways of approaching things. So Claudio Abreu was also a musician. And in his moment of inspiration, he came up with the idea of having orchestras in all of the poorest communities. He started with choirs because they didn't have any instruments, but he then moved that into getting instruments. In the communities, uh, he had the high, again, excellence, beauty, aspire to, absolute highest standards. It wasn't, can we come all together and make noise? Interestingly, in Venezuela, he used classical Western music, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, etc. cetera, uh, in part because he wanted to frame break. This is different from before. He, of course, being an orchestra, was teaching all of the skills around community commitment, what it means to show up, what it means to be your best. At this point, jumping ahead, there are, there are El Sistema orchestras in over 50 countries around the world. There are over a half million kids who came into the El Sistema system in Venezuela in 400 orchestras. Some of the top musicians and conductors in the world right now have come out of there. One of them, who you see some of the pictures in there conducting, is Gustavo Dudamel, who happens to be the conductor right now of the LA Philharmonic. And my 93-year-old mother is the longest subscriber to the LA Philharmonic of anybody else there. So that means I've gone to hear them a lot. That wasn't a part of the lecture. That was just me. Uh, that's Gustavo Dudamel up there right now. If you look at the outcome measures of the kids, starting with Venezuela, who are in El Sistema, they get higher grades than the kids who are not there. They're more likely to finish high school than the kids who are not in El Sistema. They're more likely not to be involved with drugs, with other forms of violence, with gangs, et cetera. They're more likely to go on to higher education. They're more likely to have sustained, stable um, careers after in the full range, not, not as musicians. The majority of them certainly don't become musicians. But if you look at all the characteristics that you would want in a society, you're, you're getting them out of that program. Now, somebody the other day asked me, then why is Venezuela such a mess? Well, you can't solve all of the problems from there, but that's a whole longer conversation. El Sistema has been a part of that dialogue in trying to change things. El Sistema is not alone. If, take out your passport, go to Estonia for a minute, you've got a totally different situation but you also have music that ended up being a core part of the reason that they, after 50 years of Soviet rule, got back their autonomy and their independence. So think for a moment, how do you keep an aspiration alive for two and a half generations? How do you bring your kids' kids into the notion that you could be free when they've never lived free and their parents have never? lived free and had a culture? How do you keep people courageously going up against, at that point, the Soviet Union? How do you, how do you, how do you? One of the traditions in Estonia was community singing, folk singing. 
okay? These great big groups, as you see in the thing, coming together and singing. The Soviets, now this is, watch the lens on this one, go back to the first one. The Soviets had no problem with the Estonians continuing their folk singing tradition, including the festivals of everybody coming together because it wasn't a tank, it wasn't a gun, it wasn't a political speech. So, fine, it's music, not dangerous, right? Well, you can guess that one, you've got everybody coming together, two, they were very smart about the nuances in the songs and how that was sung, and that was the core, and it also was the core sense of community and of inspiration. I want to give you, it's just one minute, um, there, it's a little video clip. It's actually Connie Chung from... It was an extraordinary show of mass defiance in the Baltic region hear? of the Soviet Union. Whenever you give free speech to people, then things get out of hand. This singing together, this was our power. If 20,000 people start to sing one song, then you just cannot shut them up. It's impossible. What role can singing play when a nation is faced with annihilation by its neighbors? Can culture hold the people together? country of Estonia has faced these questions. So, and is it just Estonia? Is it just Venezuela? I could, I won't, but um, there's been uh, brilliant documentation on South Africa under apartheid use of all forms, including music, um, to advance. And one of the things that got focused on was the toy toy, which was a form of dance. But also, if you look at how people moved together, they were moving to the rhythm of the toy toy. Um, and there are actually some of the leaders that came out and said that the toy toy was our weapon. We didn't have normal weapons, but we had the toy toy. Um, you see the similar thing in the Middle East. One of the um, most courageous examples is the West Eastern Divan Orchestra that's half Israeli, half Arab, um, and with the whole notion of if you bring people together, then, and you co-create, you don't just bring them together in dialogue, but you co-create, you create something um, that couldn't have been without everybody together. Is it just West Eastern Divan Orchestra? There's a similar group um, in Cyprus with the Greek and Turkish Cypriots who have to um, pass over the green zone, the demilitarized zone, to come together in the choir. And inside that choir, they actually commission now music where the lyricist would be a Greek Cypriot and the the composer would be Turkish or vice versa. So they begin to use synergy, not trying to make me like you or you like me, but using the synergies. Well, we know a lot about harmony in music and how harmony creates forms of beauty. There's another group, again, just so it, um, in Ireland called Different Drums of Ireland. That's the uh, Protestant and Catholic with the big Protestant drums and the smaller Catholic drums. They've had all of their drums destroyed because people were not willing to get near them, and then they began to see, and they got into the rhythm, and it spread on out. Um, in each of those cases, people needed to have courage to even show up because I'm joining with that group in society that's seen as the enemy. So then you start thinking of the power of the arts why would I risk people hating me because I'm joining with the enemy, Israeli, Palestinian, Catholic, Protestant, whatever, in order to sing together or play music together? What is it that's so inherently a part of our humanity? And the last example that I want to give you, um, 
I, I think um, is one of the most powerful because it, it takes place, I'll show you a clip and let you listen to them for a moment, but it's the Pontonema Choir. Pontonema means soul bridge. Pont, bridge, Pontonema, soul, soul bridge. Um, it was formed at the end of the war in the former Yugoslavia. It was formed in Sarajevo at a time when almost 11,000 people had been killed, not counting the people who got maimed, just in Sarajevo alone, so that everybody in Sarajevo knew somebody who had gotten killed. And most of those people who were killed were killed by sniper fire. In other words, it wasn't that you did and you knew, and if you just did this, you walked out the door at the wrong moment and you got killed. At that point, the, the choir director in the largest Catholic church at Sarajevo realized that he no longer had enough people for a choir, for his choir in the Catholic church. And so he asked what I think is a profound question, which he asked to the bishop for that area, which is, can I invite the others to join our choir? Meaning, of course, the Eastern Orthodox, the Muslims, the Jews, the Protestants, along with the Catholics. And the bishop said yes, which also took huge frame-breaking courage. So they put out the notice, and the first night that they came together for that choir, 60 people showed up. And again, picture sniper fire. Why would I walk out? Why would my whole family is saying, how dare you join the others and show up? The choir master then did one other thing. After he got them singing, and again, high standards, not, oh, we, you know, fine, we can just sing here is he then invited the choir as a whole to start singing each other's sacred music. So the community of the whole formed the container to let individual identity at its most profound level soar. Uh, and they have gone on to win all sorts of peace awards and um, influence, etc. I want to let you hear them. One of my favorite parts in putting together this talk was listening to a bunch of the clips from the different traditions when they were singing, pretending I was choosing one, but I was actually just listening. The images that you'll see on the screen are what was going on outside while they were singing.
So let me close by coming back to us. Because in a sense, if now is the time to invoke beauty, then now is our turn. And one of the problems with looking out at the whole world and what's going on is it's really easy to feel like, nice that they did that, but what can I do? I'm just me. And one of the things I've come to understand more in this past year than perhaps ever before is that each person who acts, acts from where they stand. They use who they are and where they stand in society to then make a difference. And one of the um, clips we don't have time to see tonight is from a man that's uh, referred to as the cellist of Sarajevo. Uh, and he was the number one cellist in their orchestra. He was invited as a guest soloist all over the world. And he was in Sarajevo. And one of the days when it, was, it actually got into the international news, 17 people were killed waiting in line to buy bread. They were just mowed down by a sniper fire. Um, he just couldn't stand it anymore. So there was one image of him in the, um, in the picture before, is he took, he dressed up in coat and tails, you know, like he was going to a concert. He took his cello, he went to the bombed out National Library, and he played his cello, okay? He invoked beauty, humanity, in the middle of all that. Now, if you're in a city that's got sniper fire and you just walk out, guess what? If you're playing your cello, you're really visible. But at that moment, and, and he actually played, but in different locations for the next 17 days, he used what he had to invite people back into their humanity. And he used his courage to do that. If we look right now, and we could have a discussion for the rest of the evening about it, of who are the people right now in, in different parts of the world, in different professions, that are using where they stand to make a statement. There's been a huge um, conversation, brouhaha, going on in the US right now on what the US calls football, okay, of the football players taking a knee, meaning they don't stand during the national anthem as a statement about equality and, okay, it isn't, none of, the, none of the football players are going out there with a cello, okay? They're taking where they stand. If you look at um, George Takai, who was uh, jet lag. Star, Star Trek. Star Trek. Um, thank you. It's always good to have when you're jet lag, okay? He wrote an amazing play that opened last year on Broadway called Allegiance, talking about his family's own experience, well, based on his family's own experience, in the Japanese internment camps in the US during World War II to kind of try to wake up the country that we're capable of both good and bad, so we need to choose good rather than. But he used the fact that he is a very good actor and director and knew that, so he used his form. I watch right now on one of the cable, North American cable news stations, MSNBC, there's a woman, Rachel Maddow. She's a, you know, she's a PhD, Oxford political scientist. She gets out there every evening. She uses more of what we teach in leadership theory, including positive deviance and you can act from what, and she just kind of teaches, I mean, she doesn't label it as such, it kind of looks like a news analysis. But she's basically saying, this is your world, <coughs> this is your country, and then she has examples. Of my favorite one is this community in Virginia that was trying to get the attention of their representative, and he would have none of it, and he wouldn't listen to them, and he wanted to vote to get rid of health care, and they wanted health care, and all that stuff's going on. and so. The little news clip that she happened to put on was they finally, I think this is so, speak about creative thinking, clever. They went to a gourmet pizza shop. 
They got the gourmet pizza in the big box, right? They put their message signed by everybody in the community on the top, you know, little layers so it wouldn't get glued all in there. And they had the pizza delivery guy go and deliver it to the office. Well, they weren't opening the door to the office when the people came by, but when the pizza delivery <laughs> thing alone was coming in there, and of course, they happened to have the people there and a video camera and the press, so it got remembered. But, but the question in all of this isn't, can I be the next president or prime minister of the country, unless that's what you want to do and that's what you would be good at doing. The question, or as Helen Clark just did, why just New Zealand when we could do all of the United Nations? And good for her for getting out there and trying to bring breaks. Okay? The question is, from where I stand, how do I keep my eyes open so I can see? How do I take from what the artists can support me in doing? How do I keep my imagination so it's bigger than the trapped, constrained well that just really is impossible, so you can't do it. So it goes back to what we're capable of in humanity. And how do I draw from the best of inspiration, which often comes from our poets, from our playwrights, from our, in order to move. But I do that from where I stand. So then I'm the one who is a part of invoking beauty, and I'm a part of bringing more of those moments of beauty back into all of our lives. And you lucky New Zealanders, and for those of you who are living in New Zealand but aren't New Zealanders, I'm including you in it. The whole world is watching you right now. So you're on a stage, whether you define yourself as an actor or not. And that's a really privileged, fabulous place to be right now in the world. So I have faith that you're going to be outrageously successful if for no other reason than we need you. Thank you. <laughs>